There we go. Uh, so yeah, some how to some what's going on and some great information to kind of introduce some people some of it it'll be a refresher course for some people it'll be new it depends on kind of where you're at in your um, biological farming uh, journey I guess we can call it a journey yeah. yeah and and thank you I'm sure that some of you were at the regen rev that was a lot of fun that, that, was, was, that was we had a great time doing that really enjoyed it yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think a lot of what we'll talk about today, Steve, you and I just attended a week at the Moses Conference and heard a lot of information. And, and some of that was the idea behind that I saw there is, you know, there's a lot of practices out there of trying to build soil health. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good things out there. But, you know, there's a lot of things that we're missing based on paying attention to the basics. And that's really yeah. kind of why we want to get started here. Back to the nuts and bolts. Perfect. All right. Well, you ready to started. go? All right. Well, I'm going to get let this go and uh have fun dennis all right we will we will <laughs> <laughs> nice try huh yep so welcome everybody so we've talked a little bit about the nuts and bolts and you know as i said with the moses conference one of the things that i took away from that is i heard a lot of people talking pertaining to all the different things that they're doing to try and build uh soil health and some of the frustrations some of the successes and so i so much of it I found was what I call the foundation, building the foundation of building, I call it habitat. And Dr. Hatfield made a quote clear back in 2018 and was talking about this before, the soil biology and biological fertilizer is the key to the future of agriculture. And we all know that, that's why we're here. But when we try and make that climate, it, it kind of made me think of a, a story that, that I wanna tell here based on building habitat. and. This was a grower uh, in Colorado who was telling a story to me one time, we were talking about pheasants and he was telling me how there used to be pheasants all over his property. And he used to remember his young boy going out during hunting season and the fond memories he had of his son um, going out and harvesting those pheasants and they would have them for dinner. And he said that, you know, over time they noticed that the pheasant population had declined and, and he and I were talking about that and it directly correlated to when they changed their agricultural practices. And they went more from cattle and grazing to more hay production. Um, they took out their fences. Uh, they took out that bottom ground that used to just be for pasture and killed everything and made it into hay ground, made it flattened it out a little bit, made it easier to harvest. Uniform. Uniform. Yeah. You know, uh, they started to spray uh, herbicides in order to control, control the weeds. They started to use insecticides to control the insectant to make a better quality product. Um, they took out all their fence rows. So anyway, he and I were talking about that and we talked about how he was destroying the habitat. Um, he would get that last cut in the winter just to get it enough hay in and leave pretty much just a bare soil there. So the, the pheasant population had nowhere to hide. He was spraying weeds in the springtime during the nesting season of the hens. And so that was uh, causing quite a bit of a problem with the, the nesting. And then he was also spraying insecticide right when those young birds were gonna hatch. And the, the insects are a main food source for those young chicks when they're first getting started. And so then he would cut his hay and chase all the pheasants out of the field to their nesting ground and they had nowhere to go. And the reason I bring this up is this is really similar to what we do in agriculture today. Um, and it's a little bit what Dr. Hatfield talked about. Um, basically, Dr. Hatfield is a laboratory director for the National Laboratory of Agriculture and the Environment. Um, he spent his lifetime looking at agriculture and how agriculture would affect um, overall soil health. But he looked at it more from the standpoints with the innovations that we had in agriculture, the new herbicides, the new fungicides, the new fertilizers, the new seed varieties, that we were going to produce enough food for the world and everything was great. And, and really, that's what he looked at, like all of us in agriculture. Um, but he started to realize towards the end of his, end of his career that this really wasn't so uh, happening. He, you know, we were hitting uh, where rather than having yield increase and better food quality, it was actually on the decline a little bit. And it was partly because of our soil health. 
We were missing that biological activity or that foundation of the stair step as he calls it, the invisible and dynamic process and the visible outcome. And a lot of it I talk about on the invisible and dynamic, when we think about that pheasant and that grower that loved those pheasants in his field, that was visual. He saw that decline in pheasant and knew why. But we don't always see that within our soil environment. We beat up our soil, we've lost the habitat and the carrying capacity in order for the diversity of that biology to function within that soil environment. And so when we start to think about it in that way, and we start to think about 95% of our food comes from the soil. Um, so the soil is a very important component to all parts of agriculture. And that's what we're trying to talk about here. How do we build that? How do we make that stair step climb without falling backwards? And so a lot of times when I get started, this is really what I wanna talk about as every grower um, needs to think about this as they start down the road to regenerative agriculture and the regenerative path. And now the springtime is when we really need to start thinking about this is there are many aspects that we should generally look at when evaluating a new field. And this is what I do. And a lot of times when I go into a new grower or Steve, Mark, or I, anybody here at the office, mm -hmm. um, first thing we talk about is what is the history on the farm? And what does the future hold for the farm? What things do we wanna do and what things can we implement? And a lot of times my first question is herbicide, fungicide, and pesticide use. Not only the history of it, but also what is the future of it? Um, you know, I'm one of those individuals that I realize in agriculture that we can't go cold turkey, that we have to continue to farm, we have to continue to be profitable. And sometimes we may have to use these tools. We may have to use a herbicide application as we're trying to balance our soil, increase our biological activity, increase our soil health, so we don't have to spray as much herbicide. Same with the fungicides based on nutritional plant, overall plant health and with the, with the pesticides. So we may have to use them. If we do have to use them, what things do we need to do in order to fix them? Um, so we've sprayed a fungicide application. What do we need to do biologically in order to move forward and get ourselves back on the right regenerative path? So that's a conversation I have in each of us as growers. We need to have that conversation or what are these going to do to prevent me from making that stair step climb of soil health? And we got to look at our tillage. We got to manage tilling, uh, tillage. I often look at putting iron in the ground sometimes makes sense. Is it no-till? Is it minimal till? Is it strip till? What works for you as a grower? And we need to decide that. And then it, whatever practice we're using, how can we benefit specifically biologically to enhance habitat for our soil environment? And I'll talk a little bit about this later when we talk a, a, about products and, and how that may affect it. Uh, crop rotation is a, a great thing that we need to talk about here. Um, how can crop rotation help us build soil carbon, build soil health, build diversity of microbial communities, and we need to look at our budget. Those are all things that I look at. Then I want to look at, as Bruce always said, test don't guess. I want to look at a soil analysis. I want to look at tissue, sap, leaf extract. You know, we need to look at this Haney test, the soil health assessment. What tools are out there to let us know how biologically active our soils are and, um, you know, what things we can do based on product selection, not only food, but also microbial inoculums or crop rotation to enhance that. What things can we do as a grower to maximize our habitat increase so we have a better carrying capacity for our environment? And then we look at our leaf and sap analysis, not only based on nutrition, but what nutrition is not being made available based on that soil analysis and what things do we need to do based on digestion and soil health to help make those things available. So there is so much more information that we get out of a soil analysis or a tissue or plant sap analysis just of what fertilizer do I need to apply? Yeah. Um, what biological do I need to apply? What do I need to look at it? We need to interpret these just a little bit different. And I always say nutrient excesses or deficiencies. 
And I say excesses cause a much greater problem than a deficiency. So we need to have that information. And the example I will give you off is maybe a soil analysis and a tissue analysis based on things we're seeing in excess in the plant is uh, manure or compost. You know, we often say manure and compost are a great thing. They help build organic matter. They help build carbon. They're microbe food. Um, what can be bad about compost and manure? But when we start to look at a soil analysis and we start to see we have excess in potassium and magnesium and mm -hmm. sodium and our pH is at an 8.3, and then we apply a manure out there that most likely, from my experience, may be excessive in any or all of these things and yeah. very high in our soil pH, we're not doing what is best for our environment or our habitat for building that microbial community. So we also have to test our compost and understand how they affect that soil environment. And if we have excess of sodium and a high pH and our compost is excessive in sodium and pH and chloride and copper and whatever else we wanna talk about, it doesn't make sense to do it. So how else do we build organic matter mm -hmm. um, within our soil environment? And that goes back to the idea of crop rotation, crop selection. What crops can we use? Dead microbial biomass, increase that microbial community within that soil environment, push the root exudates, all things we're gonna talk about today. Um, and so we look at soil level and compaction. Again, I talked about iron in the soil. I can think of numerous growers I have dealt with where ripping the field was the best thing for us to do in order to get some oxygen in there, break that compaction and that hard pan layer and in order to get roots down into that soil environment and get that microbial community functioning within that soil environment. And a lot of times that can also be done with cover crops. So a lot of information we need to think about when we start our springtime application of biology and our water quality. You know, so often I, I hear uh, dryland growers say, you know, if I only had irrigation, well, you know, sometimes irrigation can cause very large problems within agriculture. And we're seeing it more and more often based on bicarbonate levels, pH and sodium levels. Yeah. Um, so how do we manage that based on our uh, building of soil health and how can microbes help us? We'll talk a little bit about that later. So there's a lot more things that we talk about, but let's kind of get started because I really like to say the one thing to me that I've really missed this last year um, with yeah. the pandemic and everything that's going on, I know it's been different for all of us, is my lack of ability to be able to get out on a piece of land with the owner and leave footprints in the soil and really figure out this is the best fertilizer. And so often when I'm walking the field or I'm walking that soil, as growers, this is what we need to do. We need to feel that soil underneath our feet. And what is it trying to tell us? We have to smell that soil. Steve laughs at me all the time. First thing I do is grab out my Leatherman. I start <laughs> cutting a piece of soil and, and I smell it. I want to smell that sweet, earthy smell, those anamycetes working within that soil environment. Do we have any biological activity? Do we have any smell in that soil? Kind of like I sometimes think of after a thunderstorm in the sun of time yeah. and that rain and you get that great smell. Is that in your soil? Um, and if it isn't, what do we need to do to get it there? Um, I like to touch the soil and feel the soil and feel the structure of that soil. Is it hard and crusted? What am I lacking basically on soil component in order to build structure? Um, I like to taste the soil. And when I say taste the soil, I think of my grandfather, an old German farmer, uh, growing up with him as a kid and going over there and pulling a carrot out of his garden and wiping it off with my shirt and eating it. And I remember how sweet those carrots were. And so as a grower, we need to walk through and test our field, test our, taste our fruit, taste our lettuce, our row crop vegetables. Are they something that tastes good? And if we're missing something in that taste, what things do we need to do in order to change that? And then I wanna to listen to the soil. I talked about pulling that carrot out of the ground. What I remember is you'd grab a carrot by the green top and you'd pull it out and it came out of the ground. You didn't break the green top off mm -hmm. of it. Um, we had nice, light, fluffy structure. Um, when I pull a weed out of the ground, when I'm walking somebody's field, what sound does it make? Is it well rooted in that ground? Are there dreadlocks on those roots? You know, one time, and I don't do this anymore, but one time I was at a cherry grower. He had about a 15 year old cherry tree and I reached down and pulled it out of the ground so I could look <laughs> at the roots. Um, so they don't like it when you pull the big cherry trees out of the ground. So I quit doing that. I do smaller weeds now these days. I was also younger back then and quite a bit stronger. Yeah, that takes some strength. Yeah, it was. Yeah, <laughs> I put it back in the ground. <laughs> 
So we've talked a little bit about uh, what we need to do based on paying attention to, and now we've made our decision of, okay, we're gonna start applying our biology. And so when we start to talk about this, obviously in furrow, plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. We want them into that soil environment. We want them in the ground where we can actively get them functioning with that root. You know, Steve talked about over the last two and three years about the rhizophagy cycle, that the research that Dr. White is doing and how important a germination that is for that microbial community. So we need to remember that that is very important that we need that biology around that seed and around that root. And that's this upper left picture. You can see a one grower has now fitted all of his equipment to do his biological applications in furrow because um, he's seen the importance and the benefit of doing that. Um, if we can't do in furrow, you know, uh, soil spray, light incorporation or a soil drench and a lot we need to pay attention to that we'll talk a little bit about, I think later, but these are questions we have to ask. How are we gonna get that biology into that soil profile? And we need to look at our filters and screens. On the top right, you see a filter. If we're using a 200 mesh filter and we're using fish and humates and kelps and biology, we are going to filter some of that out. Now we worry about, are we getting that biology applied in pro in a living state that that biology can provide the function that it needs to? And the biggest thing is just headache of plugging screens and filters when you're out trying to do a biological application. 50 mesh filters is what we recommend. Um, so we need to make sure our equipment is set up to handle the application that we're trying to do. Um, so often I look at dry soil, too dry or too wet. Um, this is one of the things applying biology. A lot of times I'll use the example of my fruit growers. Um, you go into harvest time, you shut off the irrigation system. Um, you have pickers out there for an extended period of time or during nut harvest, it's 100 degrees out there. It's drying out that soil. We're stressing that plant. So the first thing we want to do is not go spray biology is we want to get some water back into that soil environment. We want to get some moisture back into that tree. We want those root exudates going back into that soil environment. Now let's apply our soil application of biology in a, into an environment, a habitat to where it can survive. And then uh, let's follow up with our foliar nutrition. Same holds true out in agriculture. A lot of my growers this fall in the Kansas area, they've been in a drought, Kansas, Colorado, Nebraska. Mm -hmm it didn't make sense to do the fall primer program. There was no moisture there to keep that biology alive. So we held off on that as long as we could until the moisture came. Some of the things we need to think about when applying biology. Obviously, uh, storage is very important. This is a living system. We need to remember that. So dry storage in temperatures that are moderate, which actually you or I would be very comfortable in, not too hot, not too cold, not on the dashboard of the pickup truck, even though as kids driving down the highway back in the 60s, we used to ride in the back window. Um, we don't allow that anymore, <laughs> um, but not a good place for biology to be or kids. Um, and then tank mixing. We always wanna pay attention to pH of tank mixing. And we also wanna make sure that, uh, that we're putting food to support biology in that tank and always add the biology last. And last, we always want to have some good agitation. So now we've talked a little bit about uh, what we're going to do for our growing season, applying that biology. Now let's give it a little bit of food. I went to the doctor last week and doctor said, you put on a little bit of weight since the last time I saw you. And I started <laughs> laughing. I said, doc, I'm eating healthy. I cut out salt, no more salt on my ice cream. <laughs> I'm not eating decaffeinated pizza or caffeinated pizza anymore. And I'm drinking hundred percent frat free beer. And it's always the dose seconds. Um, <laughs> that's all you need. <laughs> yeah, that's all I need. And he, so my point is here is sometimes what we think we're doing is good, not only for human health, may not be good for soil health either. So we got to talk about, and I, I like this, I can't eat the whole pie. You can and you will. Feed and biology needs to be, you know, I call it baby steps. We don't want to overwhelm that soil with food. And I'll talk a little bit about that based on the type of food that we're given that soil environment. So obviously the best food for biology, root exudates, a living plant. 
There's just nothing that can replace that within the soil environment. So as a grower in agriculture, we obviously can't always have cover crops or companion crops or diversity within our crop. We are a monocrop agriculture system. So when we, we can't have that living plant and those root exudates 365 days a year, that's when we need to talk about uh, feed and biology. You know, I go back to the, um, one of the things when during that pheasant, when he was creating habitat, mm -hmm. he would feed those pheasants in the fall yeah. and the winter and the spring when food was scarce. Um, we need to do the same thing to our biology. And when we talk about, uh, I guess, moderation, I'll put it. So we start to talk about microbe food and we think of molasses. Um, always raw molasses is what I feel is one of the best when we're going to use sugars in order to feed biology. The dirtier and the darker, the better. Yep. Stay away from that refined sugar yeah. um, because we want complete microbe food. Um, but one of the things we also talk about is, is um, molasses is like jet fuel. Um, we don't want to have an explosion of a population and then a crash. Um, so what we want to do is a lot of times I look at, look at the food we're feeding the biology based on timing and what we're trying to achieve. So the molasses early spring when those temperatures are cold or during maybe a cloudy or a rain yeah. event when we're lacking photosynthesis and we're yeah. not getting those exudates within that soil environment, these are all great times to do a little bit of molasses. And again, not the whole pie, just a slice. Well, and it's um, kind of like when you give kids too much sugar, they're super energetic for a little while. And then what do they do? They crash and they crash hard. We don't want our soil doing that. So we've got to make sure we don't overdo it. Right, Dennis? Yeah, and I agree. And you know, when I talk about picking foods for the, uh, to, to, to fit the situation. It's mm -hmm. kind of like when I look at your kelp, which is great micro food, great carbon, great trace minerals. But a lot of times when we're doing transplanting, when yeah. we have a little bit of stress, and we'll mm -hmm. talk about drought stress and sodium stress later, um, kelp is a great stress reducer in the plant. So not only is a good micro food, but it fits as the food to help support the crop based on the planting time and what we're doing. So these are all things we, you know, like I say, there's so many things that come into biology. I was talking to someone the other day and they said, wow, you know, I thought it was complicated doing uh, chemical mixing for spraying of <laughs> weeds. And, yeah. you know, it's not that complicated. It just takes the thought process. It's, and that's what I'm trying way to think about it. Yeah, that's what I really want to get out here. So we have our humates, which are carbon and trace minerals. Trace minerals are needed for uh, co uh, enzyme cofactors mm -hmm. for them to do their function. I don't know if I kind of said that already. Fish and amino acids. You know, this is one of those things that it's uh, bioavailable, it's calcium, it's fats, it's oils, some of what Steve talks about based on microbial reproduction. Yeah. Um, we need that calcium. We need those uh, fats and oils, great micro food, great fungal food. You know, a lot of times when I look at when we're trying to break down field debris, we're putting the biodigester out there and we want to add a little bit of fish. It gives us the nitrogen mm -hmm. to get that carbon chain broke down. It also gives us the fats and the, uh, the uh, proteins, which is good microbe and fungal food. And that's really what we want during that digestion process. So, you know, shrimp and crab is great. Uh, it's protein and calcium, but we really get to the nuts and bolts of the crop residue and the cover crops, the root exudates. Those really are what keep our biology alive on building habitat. And we'll talk about that. I've already talked a little bit about compost, great microbe food, but we got to pay attention to it. And we got to test it. Our biochar is not food, it's shelter. It gives a place for the uh, biology and the fungal to live and survive. And we need enzymes as stimulants to kind of break off those bigger chunks. And I already noticed that um, I'm probably going to run way late here, but that's okay. <laughs> I just need to talk faster, kind of like what they said, a little coffee and Red Bull will all be fine. <laughs> So now we've applied our biology, we fed our biology, now let's keep it alive. And you know, on that, we look here at the soil food web pyramid and the basis of that pyramid is biology, um, beneficial bacteria. We need that bi bacteria to build the habitat to support everything else within that soil food web. So as we build that microbial community, that bacterial community within that base of that foundation, kind of like Dr. Hatfield said, we can there stair step climb all the way to the top till we reach the pheasant. 
So what things do we need to do in order to keep that biology alive? Well, I can tell you the things we don't want to do. And it goes back to just, I call it the worm test. Don't plow our fields when they're too wet. You know what? We need to take a look at timing. If it's too dry, we create it to dust and powder. So try and pay attention in agriculture when we're out there tilling, what things can we do? Obviously, we talked about food. Um, we're burning off all of the microbe food, all of its housing, all of its oxygen. And this is the nutrition for our next year's crop. And by all means, we want to try and avoid the Isle of Death. Um, <laughs> stay away from those things that are going to cause harm, not only to uh, insects, I guess, and plants, but also to our microbial community. We got to remember that Yes, we talk and mainly hear about the rhizos here, but we have biology on the leaves, on the flowers, in the soil, around the root, inside the tissue, on the seed. Yeah. We have it everywhere. So everything that we do in the Isle of Death is going to affect our beneficial bacteria and how we build that community. Yeah, downstream consequences, yeah. Yeah, so I'm not saying we can't use them, but what we have to understand is are we using them for the right purpose? And is there something else we can do to avoid having to use them in the future? Sometimes you need a sledgehammer. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things, I mean, I'm not going to stick much on this. We all know fallow fields are, is not where we want to be. And part of that is no who, uh, no, no what? No, no home, Ooh. no food, <laughs> uh, no oxygen and no water. Um, so what things can we do? The two do's. And I talk about this based on the biological, uh, biological activity, the stair step climb, but this is really building habitat. And I can't, you know, so often I, I hear growers say, you know, we're trying these inoculums and we're just not getting to where we want to be. Sometimes when we first get started, we have to build the habitat and the carrying capacity to support the life that we're putting into that soil. And we also need to make sure that we're taking care of it. Um, so I, I look at this as, this is Dr. Hatfield of the passive protective blanket and the active protective blanket. But when we start to look at, about, look at how they function, they both do the exact same thing. You know, the passive protective blanket here, we moderate the force of rain, we moderate temperature, we reduce wind erosion, we retain moisture, um, regulate temperature, and we create habitat and food for the biology. And then on, underneath that, we look at weed control, building soil organic matter and carbon and building, um, well, organic matter. But when I, I kind of have that split up, and if you think about these first four on top as regulating temperature and habitat and food for the biology, is these are the things that we talk about. Um, the force of rain, creating a crusting on the soil, yeah. crusting that so we don't get CO2 respiration. We now are moderating the oxygen level within that soil environment. We're moderating the temperature based on that cover and that shading. We're increasing oxygen level by reducing that compaction with that cover crop, and we're retaining moisture. All the things biology needs in order to survive. Mm -hmm. So now we've done that, and now we can go into creating what we see based on nutrition and building soil health. Our weeds start to get reduced or change. We yeah. start to increase our soil organic matter, our soil carbon, and we start to build organic matter. So these passive protective blankets and these active blankets both do the same thing on building environments to support the habitat for, uh, for microbial communities. And we have to look at it. It's not an off-season expense. It's a deposit into the future bank of overall soil health, plant health, and nutrition. And with that, what is that building? We're building the soil aggregate. We're making a deposit into soil health, and we're starting to take those polysaccharides, the glomalian, the uh, mycorrhizae. We're starting to entangle and build structure within that soil environment, which really gets us to the third rung on Dr. Hatfield's stair step of basically building soil health, building stable carbon. This is where we're at. As we see on the left-hand picture here, the dreadlocks around that plant. This is the beginning of creating a stable aggregate, aggregate within that soil environment. And when we think about it on the food or soil food web, 
Now we start to see the next climb. We've created the habitat to support all this other life as we see up here on the top left picture um, of this slide. So now let's get into, we've built the soil environment to get that biology. We know what we need to do. Um, let's talk about which product. And again, 95% of our food comes from the soil and it really, uh, I guess, fits this picture well, healthy soil for a healthy life. If we don't build this biology, we're never going to have balanced nutrition in our plant and we will never have good nutrition for human health. And in my opinion, we will never balance soil nutrition or plant nutrition without paying key attention to our biology. All the chemistry in the world thus far when it comes to agriculture has not given us balanced nutrition in our plant. We need that biological community in order to do this. That's the base of the pyramid. It yeah. is. So the when and the why. So I get questions all the time, when do I apply a biology? And you know, I think this is a really good example. Um, I guess I'll just start with this red falls that you see here on the right. This is actually an outflow of a reddish plume of water at the edge of the Taylor uh, Glacier in East Antarctica. It's a site like no other. Science initially thought the red color was due to some form of algae and later found that it was because the presence of salinity and iron that gave the water its color. Almost 2 million years ago, the glacier sealed off a small body of water containing an ancient microbe community. Below that layer of ice, they metabolized sulfate and furic ions in order to survive. So we had a body of water that was sealed off by ice on a glacier and the microbes within that found a way to survive and function and continue to grow. And I put that out there with the idea of when do I apply my biology in the spring? And a lot of times, you know, we talk about soil temperature when things start heating up. But a lot of times I say when that plant actively starts to come out of dormancy, that mm -hmm. microbial community within that soil environment is already functioning. And those, the most dominant uh, strain of beneficial bacteria is going to change based on soil temperature, water, and food availability. So a lot of times, obviously, in furrow application on orchards at budswell, when we start to see that plant come out of dormancy, um, in row crop, obviously, when we're planting, because that makes the most sense. But on the bottom right picture here, you can see this little chart, which is uh, microbial activity based on time. And I disagree with this chart a little bit, and I'm going to explain why. If you see on this chart, based on the last frost, uh, biology starts to come out of dormancy. That's generally when we're planting. We have our plants coming out of dormancy. They're putting those root exudates back into that soil environment, and we start to see a peak early summer. In the row crops, which this was kind of done off of, um, cropland, we look at now suddenly we start to see a crash. Well, that directly correlates with when those plants are drying out and those root exudates are no longer going into that soil environment. The microbes have lost their food. Um, so then late summer, we, and also that's the driest period of the year. It's yeah. when we get ready for harvest. And then we see a little bit of that fall rain and we see a bump a little bit in that microbial community. And then we start to crash again based on temperature. But a lot of this we can talk about when I, I, I look at when we say companion crops, what if we had a companion crop in their midsummer that carried those root exudates into a longer period of time? What if we had a food source for that biology that basically kept it actively growing and alive, not only later in the year, but also in the springtime? What if in the fall we were able to put in a multi-species diverse cover crop? We suddenly now balance out and maybe have something more of that midsummer application of that biological community because really the longer we can keep it active within that soil environment the quicker we build habitat and the more stable soil environment that we receive. Well as we build that blanket I kind of like to think about it. I mean you look at this this is like the Rockies by creating that blanket creating that buffer rather than the Rocky Mountains we've got the Appalachians we've got foothills where we're leveling that off so 
By doing that and creating that environment, that habitat that Dennis has been talking about, we're extending the period of activity, which leads to even more soil building, even more nutrient release. So as the system gets rolling, it's like an avalanche, like a snowball going down the hill. Once you get it going and going well, until we do things to disrupt it, we can really pick up speed and keep it moving forward. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's really what we have to think about here in the springtime yeah. of how, what tools do we have as a grower? Because every agricultural system is different. I have not found two growers that are exactly the same when it comes to equipment, crop rotation. And we really need to take a look at what fits as a grower system, for our operation. Yeah. And a lot of times that's asking a lot of questions and getting a lot of information to make the best decision of, of what's going to work for you. So let's talk a little bit about what? The tiny microbes. I get asked a lot of questions about why our microbes are, why do we have what we have and how do we use it? And so much I talk about the idea of a community. If all we had was planners and doctors in our community, not a lot else would get done. Um, if you want to build a community where people want to come and you want to build a city, you have to have the police department. You have to have those men and women out there protecting us from the bad guys. You have to have the miners and the, uh, the, the heavy dirt movers in order to build a community and build roads and infrastructure and our water. You need the farmer to plant the seed. You need the trash collector to haul away the garbage, recycle it so it can be reused. You need the brick layers to kind of stick everything together and build structures and homes for people to live. And you need the fireman or the fire person. You always need that individual out there. They'll run into a, build, a burning building to save you. They'll uh, rescue you from a car crash and they'll save the cat. No matter what you need, you have to have those firemen. And that's kind of what our biology is built upon. Yeah. We have individually grown individuals that basically <clears throat> are made up into a product. They have a complete media with trace mineral and a, a complete mineral profile, plant growth promoting hormone producers. We got uh, nitrogen fixers. We got organic matter digesters, carbon sequestration, phosphorus solubilizers. We have the whole community there. And this community is built based off of function and the idea that it is the foundation of building that microbial community and that stair step to get everything started. So, you know, we talk a little bit about, and I get the question all the time, what are PGPRs? Well, yeah, those microbes you're talking about, and I kind of like the analogy comparing them to different functions, because you can. You can find microbes that basically represent most of those functions, the garbage collectors, the saprophytes, the insects that are there to destroy things that shouldn't be surviving in the environment. There are protective organisms that act like the firefighters or the police. And there are food workers that are primarily um, creating food and creating biofertility for the plant. And a lot of these are known as plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, PGPR. And they have a wide variety of benefits. And it's not generally one benefit. They generally offer a wide diversity of benefits. So it's not just one organism doing one thing. They're doing many things. And those can be broken down basically into direct effects and indirect effects. The direct effects are generally associated with nutrient acquisition, plant growth, phytohormone production, um, nitrogen fixation, things of that nature. The indirect effects, impacts on the plant, are generally associated with, associated with either biotic living stresses or abiotic stresses, non-living stresses. So these organisms can help protect the plant from living threats, as well as the environmental threats, like Dennis was talking about, is we're creating that buffer, we're creating that environment to allow those organisms to grow. That's what these microbes are doing. They're building that structure, building that soil, and they're all working together, that community like Dennis was talking about. Yeah, so now that we have kind of an understanding of, of why we build our product and the foundation of that product, I'm mainly going to talk today a little bit about our spectrum line. I get a lot of questions about that, which one to use and why and what is the differences. And so the spectrum, the main spectrum product that a lot of growers use is the foundation. It's what we just talked about. It's, ev it's everybody on the playing field. And then we have our, what we call kind of the specialty products based on function, which is the Spectrum Plus Myco, the Spectrum DS, the Spectrum PSB, and the Spectrum NFB. 
All of those products are based off of the spectrum foundation. So they're all going to have everything that's in the regular spectrum, plus an emphasis on function, whether that be nitrogen fixation or phosphate solubilization. So I'm gonna talk about each one of these individually just a little bit. So let's talk about the spectrum plus myco. This is built on the spectrum um, foundation with the mycorrhizae added to it. And one of the things that I wanna look at here is that it is built with the uh, endomycorrhizae. So when we start to talk about endomycorrhizae, that is about 85 or 90% of the plants out there in the world. So it, it only contains the endo because we're trying to reach a, basically a broad spectrum of plants within that soil environment. If you need the ectomycorrhizae, which would be more for your conifer trees and mm -hmm. some of your other trees, um, it is a different mycorrhizae. It's very specific. It, it hits five to I don't know, five to 10% of the plants out there in the world. So we want to make sure that we're using the right mycorrhizae for the right situation. When we start to talk about things like blueberries, it's its, its own, the Iroquois mycorrhizae. So when we're picking the Spectrum Plus Myco product, let's make sure that our plant creates a relationship with that product. So we look at our corn, our hemp, our, a lot of our row crops and our fruit trees mm -hmm. mainly are going to create a relationship with the uh, spectrum plus myco. Um, we, you know, a lot of times I talk about, we want this, as we said, in furrow application, we want those spores to come in contact with the root so that they can create that um, uh, infection so that the plant and the mycorrhizae, basically there has to be a need in order for that infection, uh, infection to occur. And so once it does occur, then it can start uh, sharing basically phosphorus, carbon, water with that plant and the plant sh uh, uh, sh shares its sugars. Um, one of the things that we have to think about though is this can take you know, uh, zero to two weeks, up to eight weeks to create yeah. that relationship. It's not fast. So that's why it's very important to have that spore next to that root or in that root zone. And it's also very important that we think about the crop. Is this a long-term crop or a short-term crop? For an example, some of your short-term crops, it may not make sense to use the Spectrum Plus Myco because by the time that infection may occur, we're already at harvest. So a lot of times the Spectrum PSB for phosphorus may be a better choice. Um, so a lot of time we wanna make sure we pick the product which is going to give us the most benefit based on the crop that we're growing. The bottom right picture here, you can see these are uh, persimmon trees. The grower had never really inoculated them with mycorrhizae fungi. He wanted to get that process started. Um, and really the best way to do that, as he and I talked about it, has always been bare ground, always heavy herbicide use. And he was going away from that. So we planted a cover crop in between the rows to get that cover crop started, a multi-species crop. We inoculated it with the Spectrum Plus Myco with the idea now we'll get cross infection into those fruit trees from that cover crop mm -hmm. that's growing within that soil environment. So a lot of times let's try and, you know, figure out what is the best way that we can do this in order to get it established. So let's talk a little bit about the Spectrum DS. Spectrum DS stands for drought stress or high sodium soils. And I want to give you an example here of uh, this was a mint field that we were looking at. And up here, you see the two blue arrows, the blue for sodium. Uh, you go across there and that blue line, the bottom line was May. This was a plant sap in May. The yellow line was in June, okay? So in May, we found that our sodium levels were really right where we wanted them. It wasn't a problem at all. Um, then the, hot, the temperature started to come and we needed to start irrigating. Um, now suddenly we see that our sodium levels have went through the roof off the chart and this is causing a problem. You see the damage to the leaf, the root, you could actually on these roots of these plants when you pulled them out of the ground, there was sodium attached wow. to that root. You could see it down on the root structure of this plant. Um, it goes back to the idea of understanding our water, understanding what our water is like and what effects we might have. But the great thing about this is, which is also when we look at our calcium up there, the bottom blue line was our calcium level in May and the top yellow line is our calcium level in June. So as our sodium increased, 
our calcium decreased. We started to block the uptake of calcium. So this is a little bit of why we talk about why does the DS work and why is it a very important within to kind of help support that drought stress in the plant. And a lot of it comes on soil structure. We see this in manures or also in water applications. And one of the things that I want to talk about a little bit is when I'm making a, a choice here. And remember, I always say excess causes a much greater problem than a deficiency. So here we see our sodium level is uh, high and our phosphorus level is low. So I'm not going to recommend the spectrum PSB for phosphorus. I'm going to go with the spectrum DS to help tie up some of that sodium and protect that plant based on that stress. And I'll go with the foliar application of phosphorus or soil applied phosphorus in order to uh, address the deficiency. And then maybe later come um, with that phosphorus application. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later when we talk about the PSB. So a little bit about, I get the questions all the time, Steve, how does this function? How does this work within that soil environment? Well, there's a lot going on kind of behind the scenes that we don't really think about, but these microbes, the PGPR that we've been talking about, provide a wide variety of benefits for the plant when they have either drought or salinity stress. And some of these are pretty incredible. So normally when a plant becomes drought stressed, um, it increases its ethylene levels. And ethylene is basically the hormone, uh, it's the signal to hurry up hurry up and reproduce. We got we to get through this. There's stress. We've got trouble. Let's try to get our seeds done. So these microbes produce uh, different molecules, ACC deaminase, for example, that helps reduce the ethylene levels. Uh, incredibly, they also produce um, different osmotic stress protective uh, materials, osmolites. Uh, they'll help reduce the antioxidant damage. Um, as these plants become drought stressed, uh, they'll oxidize themselves more and cause more damage to themselves. So these microbes are producing molecules to help protect the plant. Uh, incredibly, they'll also help the plant physically remove sodium from its tissue. So they'll signal the plant, which allows it to move some of that sodium down and out through the roots. And then a step further, once that sodium is out into the soil environment, these microbes using their extracellular polysaccharides, EPSs or biofilm, whatever you want to call it, those molecules um, that Dennis was talking about that help bind and build the soil, they can actually bind that sodium inside of that soil structure, which removes it from the availability, removes it from the, the nutrient pool. So we can actually physically reduce the sodium, as well as many, many other uh, things that are going on that we'd have to have a whole different presentation and talk about those. Yeah. So some of the other, I mean, when you look at it, they're above ground and below ground benefits. So we're seeing increased water conductance to the aerial parts. We're seeing better ma maintenance of ionic homeostasis. So our potassium levels, our ability to open and close their stomata are improved by these microbes, as well as signaling to let the plant know when to open and close the stomata to decrease uh, moisture loss. Uh, and as well as below ground, we're seeing maintenance of water balance, uh, maintenance of ionic homeostasis. So again, these microbes are helping maintain the ability of the plant to take water up, which during those drought times or when there's excessive salinity um, or excessively high uh, EC, then those plants are allowed more access to the water than they would be without those microbes, which is just incredible. And it can help save you. It's, it's again, it's the idea of these microbes create a buffer. They create an ability for the plants to grow through some of the stress. Yeah. And a lot of times that's all we need is a short period of time until mother nature gives us that timely rain that we needed. It was a week off or 10 days off. Just give me a chance. I just need a chance. a chance. Yeah. <laughs> I always said that coach. Uh, so when we start to look at the, uh, how this affects based in the soil environment, this is uh, a grower in Colorado. And this section of the field um, basically was compacted. You can still see some of the white, basically, of the crusting that was on top of the soil. As you can see, the peach trees, as they come down the rows, they significantly taper off and decline to the point of death. Um, and uh, we always referred this to Lake Culbertson um, because it was a wet area, water pooled up there, and it was, it was just a mess. Well, anyway, he came in with a cat, tilled up this area, and it was so funny because we used the Spectrum DS, we used some fish, and we put it into uh, the infrared line there where the irrigation was. This was the beginning of the project. Mm -hmm. And it was so funny because he called me up and he was so excited he had weeds growing. 
<laughs> he had never had weeds growing. Yeah. And but the great part about this is we left the weeds grow. Yeah. Oh, because definitely. now they're helping yeah. to heal that ground. Yep. We now have peach trees in this entire area. You sent me this quote um, I, uh, beginning of this year because they were actually re-putting in a cover crop. But it's just a fun story. I, I like stories like that. So let's talk about which spectrum do I use and the spectrum NFB. Um, really what I look at the NFB and one of the things I heard a lot about based off of the Moses conference is we're not building organic matter. Um, we're not building stable carbon. And this is so true in the no-till scenario, in the strip till. I heard it time and time again. And so much of that is because of the amount of nitrogen that we're using in these scenarios. We're doing no-till, but we're still using 120, 150, 180 pounds of nitrogen in order to grow our crop. So we're burning up any of that carbon. So we need to remember that in order to uh, reduce, in order to build organic matter and stable carbon, we have to manage our N. We have to make sure that we don't have excessive N burning all of that up. And that's really one of the things, not only for an organic grower, obviously N is very important for these growers mm -hmm. and, and using that atmospheric nitrogen in order to support that crop is critical but also to helping in building that habitat and that soil health is very, very important. And, you know, a lot of that is just based, how does this function and how do we get this nitrogen into the plant? How do we utilize that atmospheric nitrogen? Yeah, the NFB stands for nitrogen fixing bacteria. And oftentimes people think about nitrogen fixing bacteria. They think about legumes, they think about those nodules and they think about rhizobia. That's one type of nitrogen fixing organism. There are other types. So some of these are free living that are able to live out in the soil environment and fix nitrogen from the soil around the plant and through that rhizophagy cycle. The plant then consumes them and extracts the, the, the nitrogen from those organisms. Another route are known as endophytes and endo means inside. So these are microbes that live inside of the plant tissue and that will circle um, uh, take out kind of in the middle of the picture there kind of shows the idea of I used to think these microbes, you know, they're fairly isolated. You have them isolated in a small area, but the reality is they can grow throughout the plant. They can grow throughout the leaf, the stem. So as we increase these endophytes, we're increasing the um, activity of the nitrogen fixation throughout the plant. And this, this is a great environment. It helps restrict oxygen, which can damage the nitrogenase, and it helps the plant have access to nitrogen and amino acid throughout its structure. Yeah, so really the Spectrum NFB is, like I said, built off the base Spectrum platform, but also designed to help with, with our nitrogen need in yep. order to specifically build soil health and really get on that regenerative agriculture path. It's, it's another tool. To stop burning up your carbon. Yeah. Stru yeah. And so now we're going to talk a little bit about the PSB and on that PSB, Steve had just talked a little bit about the legumes and... Mm -hmm. Um, their nitrogen fixation. And one of the things that we look at here is, you know, obviously the NFB may not make sense here, but, you know, the PSB may make sense mm -hmm. here because obviously that nitrogen fixation is very, it takes a lot of energy in mm -hmm. order for that process to happen. And the, it takes that phosphorus, a lot of phosphorus in order to create that function. So where we're lacking phosphorus, this may be one to help um, enhance that overall nitrogen fixation across the board on those plants. And it also, you know, I talked earlier about the idea of the blueberries and the idea that they're an Iroquois. Um, and so if we're looking at increasing FOSS based on a soil and tissue analysis, we see we have a lot of P1 and P2 phosphorus mm -hmm. in our soil analysis, but on our leaf extract analysis or our tissue analysis, we're showing that we have a deficiency of phosphorus in the plant. This is where the PSB would come in. Let's go get those phosphate solubilizing bacteria functioning in that soil environment, getting that digestion and that breakdown in order to make that phosphorus available. A lot of times I see in the fruit industry, for an example, or in the row crop industries, your tomatoes, uh, any of your flowering plants, yeah. two weeks prior to flower is a great time to use that spectrum PSB. We see a great genetic expression mm -hmm. based on um, yield, yeah. based on making sure that plant has plenty of phosphorus at that time. So I'm running out of time here. I mean, I could talk about this for another 20 minutes probably. 
Um, but I, you know, as I, as I say, I, I tried to eat the elephant in one bite. <laughs> I need to take smaller bites when I chew. So, I mean, a little bit about this in, you know, is, as we say, is this phosphate solubilizing process is another function of microbial communities within that soil environment. Oh, definitely. And the research has shown that these microbes in soil environments that would normally bind up our phosphorus are able to produce a wide variety of different components to help free that phosphorus up. Phosphorus often binds up to our soil very, very quickly. And even at best uh, ideal uh, pH conditions, generally your phosphorus is only about 20 to 25% available. So these microbes are able to produce both enzymes, acid phosphatases, alkaline phosphatases, phytases, depending on what that phosphorus is bound up with. Um, they're also able to produce organic acids, and these organic acids will help solubilize the phosphorus and free it up. Uh, and the other benefit here is if we have, for example, uh, calcium phosphate, tricalcium phosphate, the enzyme that breaks that phosphorus off also is going to solubilize our calcium. So we get kind of a, a double hit. We get two benefits at the same time. And as we know, phosphorus is so critical for energy. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, needs phosphorus. Our DNA, RNA, um, our cell structure, the phospholipid bilayer, all of these require massive amounts of phosphorus. So like Dennis said, right before flower, right before that plant needs a massive energy shot to help produce its fruit, having that extra phosphorus available can be critical to that expression. Yeah. So, and with that expression, as we go across, it's all based on utilizing the right product within the environment yeah. based on its function. And, you know, we started out talking about building the habitat, getting them in the soil environment, feeding them, and now it's picking the right product. Because as we've always said, we learned a long time ago how to grow these individuals, put them in an assisted dormant state and get them to the grower. Now mm -hmm. let's make sure we get them in the soil environment alive and let's make sure we're using the right product based on function for the situation that we need. And that's where we go a little bit, I wanna talk about on the OP8. Um, you know, uh, OP8 actually stands for oil product number eight. Yep. Um, it's like WD-40. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't do it. This is our eighth revision, not our 40th. <laughs> um, but this was originally di uh, designed for digestion, um, hard to digest things. It was used a lot in the oil wells to help yeah. break down uh, contaminants. Um, but with that being said, uh, years ago, I started using it in what I called crops that would not respond to regular applications, or as I call it, rescue. Yeah. Where we have a scenario where we need to use a heavy hitter to get a plant response immediately and time is of the essence. Mm -hmm. And that's really where I see the OPA work. Um, you know, you guys have seen my picture here on the Asian pears. This was the OPA that was used here as a, um, within that soil environment, it was designed for the digestion to help make nutrition available, get that biological community at a very high active level and make that nutrition available in a state the plant can use it. We've seen this on cherry trees that mm -hmm. have been struggling. Um, I've used it in all different types scenarios. It's generally not the first thing I go to. Um, I, I found it more as what I call my rescue product when I have a severe problem. So if anybody has any questions pertaining to where should I use or how should I use or does the OPA fit into my scenario, always feel free to give us a call or talk to yeah. one of our distributors to see if it makes the most sense. But that's a little bit about the OPA product. Very diverse, very broad spectrum um, of beneficial bacteria within and fungi within mm -hmm. this product for a specific function. So let's talk a little bit about foliars. I know I'm running out of time. I wanna talk about the Micro 5000, the PZ1000 and the Micro 5000 organic. So in a nutshell, if you are organic certified, the only product you can use is the Micro 5000 organic. And make sure when we order it, because we do have two Micro 5000s that you specifically ask for Micro 5000 organic. Make sure it has that OMRI listing on the label when yep. you receive it. So we make sure we don't have any issues um, and make sure we get the right product. Um, so for the organic growers, it can be used year round. A lot of times I recommend this product 
at bud swell on fruit trees, mm -hmm. um, maybe one or two applications prior to flower, and then again after petal drop, um, right up until harvest. And then as soon as we're done harvesting, we get that irrigation cycle, rewet that ground, get that biology function within that soil environment and come back with another foliar application to get energy in those mothers because we're already producing next year's crop. Yep. Um, when we look at the PZ1000 and the Micro 5000 organic, a lot of times I look at these as Micro 5000 early for growth. It's designed for growth or vegetative state. So early on, when I talk about my corn, you know, early on at V3, V4 stage, um, when I'm talking about young fruit trees, uh, you know, I would do this early in the season. When I talk about my tomatoes, when we're in vegetative and we want a lot of growth, I'm using the Micro 5000 and then I'm following with the PZ1000 during reproductive. reproductive. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this was basically, a lot of times I use PZ1000 on wheat just based on budget, but this was foliar application that we used. Um, this was two applications early on. And this is one I do want to talk about because we talk about growth and energy within that. Um, when we talk about that, we look at, this was a blue corn in Kansas. I had, was driving with David Miller down the road in a hailstorm that I'd never thought I could ever make it through <laughs> again. And this is what we woke up to the next morning uh, with the grower. The picture on the left is what the blue corn looked like. We had a conversation with the grower and he said, look, I want to try and grow it. What do we do? So we used, uh, we put energy. We used a foliar application here with the Micro 5000 organic because he was an organic grower. Sugar, carbon. Sugar, yeah. carbon. Push that plant. Picture on the right is that same blue corn uh, just uh, later in the summer. Uh, he was very excited. I think that was June um, and very excited. This was the high, highest yielding he had had in his yeah. blue corn in his field after he did that. But the thing I want to point out is these footprints on the left. Um, you see these footprints. One of the things I noticed when we walked into this field is all the other fields we had walked into, you had six inches of mud sticking to your boot. Um, with this grower, we walked into his field. There was no standing water and the, the dirt did not stick to our shoes. Um, which was pretty interesting based on soil structure. Um, so That's again, because of the work he'd done in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Build, yeah. His he built program. that buffer. Yeah. Built the buffer. Um, so again, footprints in the field are our best fertilizer. That's right. Here's our example. Um, we're not going to, we were a little running a little bit out of time here. So I want to get to all the questions. We kind of have quite a few here um, that we need to go over, I hope. Um, so anyway, uh, I get asked the questions all the time, can we make our product with biofungicides? And the answer is yes. Um, if we're looking at the trachydermas, the Bavaria bassiana, some of these control products that are designed for control, any of the spectrum products that we talked about can be tank mixed with those mm -hmm. um, to broaden the diversity and actually offer plant support based on nutrition is really what we're talking about doing. Um, so yes, they can be added with them, our foliars or as our soil application. And with that, I want to talk about, we've been hearing a lot about fantastic successes from the different growers. Um, if you have anything out there, you've been seeing anything interesting or fun or any changes you're making to your program that we may be able to share on a webinar or help yeah. other growers Website be successful. Yep. Please send them over to us. We'd love to see them. Um, we love to share that information. And with that, I want to kind of go to, uh, really, this is almost the last slide, guys. Uh, following the products and the OMRI WSDA and CDFA. So if you want a list of this, contact us. By all means, everybody needs to uh, pay attention. If they are organic certified, that we are using the correct product. Um, on our fields, uh, make sure that we are using the uh, OMRI listed products. So if you need this information of this list, just let us know. And with that, I'm going to the beach to do an erosion conference. Woo! <laughs> Don't tell Amy. Okay. I think she might be listening. I think you might be in oh, trouble. Oh, I might be in trouble. <laughs> well, awesome. Thank you, Dennis. All right. Let's see. We do have a few questions. Um, and where do we want to start, Dennis? Go ahead. Just pick one. You, you get to do the questions. 
Let's see, ideal timing and application method for Spectrum DS for a salinity issue. You know, uh, as soon as you can. <laughs> yeah, a lot of that has to do with crop. Like I, I talk about if we're in a road crop scenario, like we're doing tomatoes or peppers or something like that, and we have plants in the greenhouse. So a lot of times two weeks before that plant going out, I would recommend that we use the DS. Maybe we use some calcium, some humate mm -hmm. is generally yes. the protocol for yes. that application. Um, get those in Help. the soil environment prior to putting the plants. And in the greenhouse, I would recommend, let's use the Spectrum Plus Michael, get that mycorrhizae uh, inoculant yeah. in with that plant before we take it out to the field. Um, same would hold true, I guess, if we're looking at bare root trees, my recommendation would be a root dip of those bare root trees um, prior to planting. And I would do a preparation of that soil environment with, again, Humates, DS, uh, nutrient it if you're organic, Pepsime G if you're not um, in that soil environment. So and we've got to figure out where is it coming from? Yeah. If, if the salt is something that you are applying through, like Dennis was saying, manure or another source or salt-based fertility, we've got to take a look at that and reduce as much as we can. Uh, if it's coming from your irrigation water, that's, that's a hard challenge, but we've worked with that and we can work through it. So as we evaluate these, like Dennis said in the very beginning, um, we've got to look at our, uh, our soil and we've got to get that um, analysis done to figure out why and where. Let's see, another question. Um, impact of water-soluble fertilizers on microbes. I, that depends on who you talk to. Um, we have listened to presentations by universities that say basically nothing you can do, nothing you do does anything to your soil biology. And that includes anhydrous ammonia. Our um, take on that is a little bit different. We have seen reductions in biological communities. And a big part of that, a good example, um, and I think Ann mentions in one of the comments, the idea of mycorrhizal fungi. If you have a lot of phosphorus or nitrogen available, the plant is only going to create those communities, create that, that it's kind of a handshake. It's going to only extend its hand when it needs help. If that patient is on life support, if the plant is on life support and you're constantly pumping it full of salt-based fertility, just like a patient in a hospital would be on a drip, then that digestive system is no longer needed. I think that generally when we see that environment, our trace minerals often suffer because without that digestive capacity, without that digestive system, we see a decreased uptake of the things we're not applying. So unless we're applying all of those in a salt-based form to just be soaked up through osmosis in the plant, we see reductions in um, those. Let's see, another part of that, how do we get those microbes going? Food. I mean, the, the biggest part is food, creating that habitat, creating that environment like Dennis was talking about. And I mean, listening to some of the presentations on like direct seeding, I, I mean, watching a presentation where they're direct seeding corn into alfalfa, it's incredible what people are starting to be able to do with some of those systems. And all of that is to maintain this living biological mass, maintain that community that's growing all the time. And by doing so, by constantly having those organisms digesting, we're maximizing our nutrient uptake. Which one? Yeah. Go ahead. So some people say microbial function groups are presence in all soil um, and we don't need to inoculate with microbes. Um, well, uh, I'll answer that question in a way of um, based on agricultural practices and history is going to have a lot to do with that. And also based on what things you can do in order to build that soil health based off of in trying to increase your native population within mm -hmm. that soil environment. Okay. But based on agricultural practices and the use of fertilizers, tillage, the use of fungicides, we've selectively mined out monocrop system, no diversity. We've selectively mined out some of the beneficials within that soil environment. 
or we do not have the habitat in order to support them. And one of the things Bruce used to talk about, there are some key players out there and there's some that come to the party based on the habitat being um, increased in order to support them. So as we increase with the inoculums that we know are based on function and we create a better environment for everybody out there, we get more players on the field. And a lot of times I give the example, if I wanna get from New York City to Los Angeles, I can ride a bike, I can drive a car, <laughs> or I can fly in a jet. Yeah. So if we want to take the process of diversity of cover crops, because we can do it, uh, crop rotation, yeah. green living plant, 365 days a year, companion crops with my existing crops, no tilling, and all those things that are conducive to raising a beneficial microbial community within that soil environment. Can we get there? Absolutely. Um, if we want to get there a little bit quicker and speed up that process, do biological inoculums make sense? Yes. And then if we do things that we know that we are going to destroy that microbial community, for example, potatoes. If you can figure out how to get potatoes out of the ground without <laughs> digging, I want to be a part of it. Teleportation. But, yeah. 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 <laughs> but we just, we, we disrupt them and yeah. we leave that exposed turned over soil dry soil onto that um you know dry soil environment in the sun uh going into the winter time and then we plow it back under and we work it and we fumigate it and yep. we get started to do it again yep. um do biological inoculums make sense there absolutely to get the process started so i i guess to answer that question is there are a million ways to build soil health and you as a grower have to determine what tools are going to get you there based on your budget, mm -hmm. based on your mindset, and based on your equipment, and based on what things you can do. Um, so if you want to get there quicker and you want to have consistent results based on biological function, I think the inoculums have a very good fit. Well, and I kind of think about it as if I'm trying to get even cover crops, am I going to purposefully seed the cover crop seeds that I want, or am I going to allow the seed bank that's already in the soil to take off? It's the same sort of idea. Yeah. If I allow the seeds that are naturally in the environment to grow, I'm going to have probably a lot of lamb's quarter, red root pigweed, and all those other fun ones that are oftentimes difficult to deal with. Um, that's what's native, that's what's there. And that's going to grow and it's going to start building your soil. But can we do it better? Can we do it more targeted? I think so. And that's why the idea of using cover crop, multi-species diversity makes a change. And it's the same with incorporating different biological inoculants. By having these purposefully built diverse groups, we know that we're getting those species into that environment just like you would with a cover crop seed mix. Uh, trichoderma, and there are, there's, oh, that's, that's, a, that's a little bit of a harder one, um, oops, uh, because there are differing opinions. There is research showing that some of the trichoderma or trichoderma, um, there is mycoparasitism that's going on, which can impact other beneficial fungi, including mycorrhizal fungi. Some of the research seems to show that it does damage those mycorrhizal communities. Some of the other research shows that some of that mycoparasitism, just like if you go out and mow your lawn, it can stimulate growth. A small amount of that can somewhat stimulate some of those fungi. So the research is still out. Our take on it is like with most things, diversity is going to be the key. If I'm only using trichoderma, if I'm only using a control product to try to control the environment, I'm going to have an impact on that environment versus trying to work with nature and create that diversity. So our view on it is like Dennis mentioned, when we're using those different pesticides, biofungicides, things like that, adding diversity is going to be the key to helping maintain that balance. Yeah, and I, I think that's really important. As, as I said, is moderation. Yep. Um, yep. Is a little bit good, absolutely. But we don't want it to be the only tool. I give the example is if you go to a mechanic and the only tool he has is a crescent wrench, <laughs> he can get the job done. Maybe. But he may, he may <laughs> beat some stuff up on the way. Yeah, absolutely right. <laughs> uh, let's see, spectrum products applied through drip. Absolutely, we have a lot of people that apply through drip. You gotta make sure like Dennis talked about, filtration, agitation, all of those things to maintain um, those 
the, the product and make sure it gets out where it needs to go. I don't think that we've had a lot of people. I mean, there are occasionally issues um, with the drip. I haven't seen many lately and we can usually identify some sand or something like that that actually got mixed in, but we have it going out through drip emitters all over the place. Yeah, and, and the main thing is making sure we put that biology inoculum in at the beginning of the drip cycle and then we flush those tubes at the end and we don't yeah. leave anything growing yes. in any irrigation yes, system. Definitely. Well, and, and you know, that really holds true of any time we're using it in irrigation systems. Yeah. A lot of times we want to do it at the beginning and then flush it in through the irrigation and also clean the lines. Let's see more more on that, Greg. Rural water. Um, yeah, gener it sounds like you have poor quality water, which you're going to have to address that, especially for your foliar. Uh, potable water containing chlorine, if it's chlorine, let it gas off because um, we don't want the chlorine mixed with the microbes because that's what the chlorine's there to do. It's there to kill them. Chloramine is a little bit harder. There are ways to neutralize it, but you're going to want to get as much of that chlorine out as possible. Basically, anything that's designed as a bacteriostatic, fungostatic, something that's going to slow down, stop, or kill the microbes, we want to make sure we have as little of that in the water as possible. Very hard water, we're going to have to deal with that. Um, there are sulfur burners and things like that for bicarb. Because very, very hard water has a definite impact on your, uh, your soil quality, your water quality, and the impacts that we have. And we work with a lot of people um, that have water uh, difficulty. Reverse osmosis, yes, those Absolutely. systems can be expensive, but for your foliar, it makes a huge difference. So we can go into more of that later um, if you have more questions on that. Uh, let's see. Uh, acceptable spray NFB and PSB as a foliar. Um, I think that you could see some benefit, the NFB probably more so than the PSB. Most of the phosphate solubilization that's going to happen is going to be down in the soil environment. If there is some phosphorus on the leaf tissue, I could see examples or situations where you might see some phosphorus uptake, but I would focus more on um, the soil application of, of those products. Yeah, and usually what I recommend Spectrum. on both those products is soil application. Yeah. Do our foliar with one of the foliar products, 1,000, 5,000, or 5,000 organic and add five to 10 grams of spectrum, yeah. just regular spectrum, because mm -hmm. the regular spectrum is going to have all those in it. It is. Yeah. Not as not as high as a concentration, but they will be there. So can I apply them like 5,000? Oh, absolutely. Yep. We have a lot of people that are doing that five to 10 grams of Spectrum or one of the other products. I've heard of people using DS to try to help with drought stress. Yep. And it does have benefits there. So yes, you can. Um, the, the ideal place for them, they're rhizobacteria, we want them in the root. Um, but yes, you can see benefits from doing that. The Aracoid, no, there are some companies that are starting to do the Aracoid mycorrhizae. They're a bit harder. It's like the orchid mycorrhizae. It's, it's a challenge to produce them. And it's so specific that we, we haven't really found um, a need, a supply uh, for it yet. So most of the blueberries we grow or most of the blueberry growers that we work with are utilizing different techniques and we're still seeing good phosphorus uptake Correct. when we maximize that biological community. But as far as the Iroquois, no, not yet. Let's see. Which one do you want to go to next, Dennis? Uh, let's see. Compost starter. Uh, you know, I mean, what I say on the compost starter or the biodigester, I work with a lot of guys that are composting a lot of different things. Generally, I look at we have to make sure that we treat it like a compost, that it's designed to break things down. The harder to break down those products within that compost, the harder uh the longer it's going to take and, and the harder it's going to be. Um, we need yeah. to make sure we have nitrogen in there to break that carbon chain. And obviously the compost is only good as what it's coming from. We have to have a yes. diverse mix when we talk about our brown to green material. Um, we want to get a good inoculation and manage moisture within that environment. And when it comes to very specific things in digesting compost, it's hard because we're looking at digesting plant material. Yeah. When we start to talk about some of those other things, there's a lot of variables that it comes to. And if we'd like, you can give us a call and we can specifically talk about how it might 
work with those based in different scenarios. Let's see if all you have is micro 5,000. Yeah, you can apply a micro 5,000 all year. When you're getting into fruit set though, that's when you're gonna wanna make sure you're applying extra potassium. Potassium is critical for sugar transport throughout the cell uh, and throughout the plant, excuse me. So once that sugar transport is uh, happening into the fruit, that potassium is locked. So you need more potassium during the fruit set. So make sure, yeah, you can use the Mic 5000 all year, but just make sure during certain stages of plant growth, you're applying the nutrition that the plant needs. Uh, sap analysis and leaf extract analysis can definitely help with that. But yes, in general, you can apply Mike 5000 whenever you want. Just make sure you're augmenting with the nutrition the plant needs at that time. Test. Don't guess. <laughs> that, yep. There it is right there. Uh, webinar on compost digestion at some time. Yeah, probably. That was easy. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, dry climate, hard to get cellulose broken out. Yeah, it is. Uh, moisture balance is critical for composting. Too wet, you go anaerobic and things massively slow down. And sometimes you can actually have alcohol production. We've, we've heard of and seen uh, like horse piles, horse manure piles that uh, alcohol production becomes too high. And at right around 180, those things can, can auto combust. So uh, dry climates, adding moisture. Um, as you break down cellulose, water is liberated. So it is kind of a self-feeding system. Um, sometimes there are some gore materials, Gore-Tex materials that help hold moisture in. We've got to be careful because we have to make sure we're maximizing gas exchange. If our gas exchange is too low, then we slow everything down. So it, it's going to be a bit of a balance. Sometimes adding more green material, which typically has more moisture, moisture is going to be a way that we can speed that process up. So let's talk more about that later, Ann, uh, and try to figure out what mixes you've got. And if we're, if we're too heavy, like Dennis was just saying, on the carbon component, we're going to slow things down as well. Uh, let's see, talk about sap analysis, xylem or phloem or a mix. Uh, leaf extract analysis is typically what we're looking at. Um, petiole analysis, not really big fans of petiole analysis. I haven't seen any many strong correlations between like petiole, uh, which is looking at your xylem flow and looking at that uh, transport tissue. I haven't seen a lot of direct correlation. How about you, Dennis? With, with, with petiole? No, I, and I, I just, I, you know, we used to use a lot the tissue, uh, some petiole, but now plant sap analysis yeah. and leaf extract analysis. Tissue analysis um, is still good. Yeah. But yes. the, the sap analysis, leaf extract analysis is, it's different. It's non-destructive of the leaf. Um, and it's actually pretty incredible when you look at the leaves pre and post Leaf extract, they look pretty much the same. Yeah, they look a dehydrate. little crispy, but everything's basically sucked out. So they're actually, they're not analyzing what's physically the structure of the leaf. They're looking at what the fluids contain, what's in the vacuole, what's in the, um, the cytosol, what's in that cytoplasm. So you're seeing what nutrition is available to the plant. So sap analysis can be beneficial, looking at pH, looking at bricks. Um, but the leaf extract analysis is, is, it's a different animal entirely. Well, and I like the old leaf to new leaf. Yes. Oh yeah. No, you definitely have you know, to. Which yeah. gives, gives quite a bit of information, which I think is beneficial based off of avail mobile versus non-mobile yeah. nutrition and getting an expression on what the plant's yeah. utilizing. So and I think that, the, that? Oh, just, yeah, moving on. So the analysis itself, yeah, um, there's Hortanova, Nova Crop Control uh, that's doing leaf extract analysis and they're doing a great job. Apical, David Knaus, uh, they're doing a great job and there are more labs that are coming up. As far as how they specifically do it, that's, those are pretty closely guarded secrets on the exact pressure and extract uh, technique that they're using. So I can't tell you how many PSI they're exactly using to break it without fully breaking it for the extraction. Uh, starting seeds in the greenhouse. Mycogenesis. Oh, yeah, mycogenesis spectrum plus myco. Uh, yeah. Those products are going to be great. They're going to put the mycorrhizae as well yeah. as all the beneficial right where you need them. Yeah, I always say mycogenesis in the greenhouse. It it, it just, works, makes it sense. works great. Yeah, yep. it works for food. 
compost starter. I think you start, you talked a bit about compost starter, yeah. uh, bush hog corn and cotton. I mean, the biggest thing, if we're trying to break down um, material, the smaller we can break it, the more access we have, um, the more basically the sites. Uh, if you imagine burning uh, a candle and I have one wick sticking out, it's going to burn at a certain rate. If I chop that candle up into a whole bunch of little pieces and I have more chunks of wick, it's going to burn faster. The same is true with our compost. So if I have large chunks of material that are out in the environment sitting on the surface, it's going to be very slow to break down. So chopping that material up and lightly incorporating it so it has soil contact and therefore more moisture from the soil as well as um, the, the microbes from the soil, you're going to see a faster breakdown. Generally, some fish, a little bit of extra nitrogen is going to help speed up that process. Again, your carbon nitrogen ratio is critical for composting. So yeah, that material needs to be broken up. Um, and then the, the, the biodigester is a great product that has a lot of cellulose digesters, helps speed up that process. So how much time between spraying spectrum on the soil and getting it scratched in before uh, the effects of sunlight, um, cloudy versus sunny day. So a lot of times what I say is if we are doing a soil application and we're going to scratch it into that soil environment, we're not going to irrigate it in. So first off, uh, apply it with carbon, make sure we have some fish, some humates, something in there to protect it, yeah. to protect the biology a little bit. Um, obviously late evening or on a cloudy day is the best time to spray yeah. it. Avoid the heat of the yeah. day, uh, midday. Um, and generally I would like to see it. I, you know, I guess my answer is as soon as possible. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, understanding that, uh, in agriculture, sometimes it takes time. If you want to give me a call based on your specific system, I could probably give you a better answer based on what you're doing, what makes the most sense on trying to get it um, scratched into that soil environment. I think that would be the better way to answer this than just give a broad statement. Yeah, ask, ask a specific question um, so we can, we can find out how you're doing it. Because again, like Dennis's slide, we've got to know the history. We've got to know what's going on in the management of how it's working so we make it work best. Surface application is generally not our favorite. We can make it work. Like Dennis said, we need some, some, sun, some sunblock, some UV protection. Um, and we need some extra food for those microbes. Let's see, question over here in the chat. Uh, Sat pH, Bruce talked um, for years about um, Sat pH and he found 6.4 is basically the ideal. There are occasionally some situations where that's not quite right, but almost always we wanna see that Sat pH right around that 6.4. And that shows that we have fairly maximized uh, nutrition available for the plant. All right. I think, I Claire think that was all of them. Great Claire. questions. Thank you, everybody. Claire has her hand raised. See if you can click on it. Let's see, one message. All kinds of plants, pretty much everything that Bruce tested and worked with, that 6.4 seems to be pretty much it. That's the way he talked. All right, hand raised. Um, yeah, Claire, if you want to type it in or ask, um, if not, send us an email and we'll uh, we'll get back to you. Because I'm not I'm not seeing a question come through. So perfect. All right, everybody. Well. Thank you very much. If you have more questions ask or us. concerns, feel free to ask, call, yeah. email, Steve or I. Yeah, um, we, we kept this right at that half hour, that 30-minute yeah. mark, just like we were supposed to. As we always to. do. <laughs> I, I can't remember the last time we actually kept you a half hour. Well, thank you, everybody. This has been great. Lots of fun. Lots of great questions, which we definitely appreciate. So keep them coming. Look forward to chatting with you soon. All right. We'll see you next month for the webinar. Should be the last Thursday of actually this month. Wow. Yeah. No, that's crazy. Yep. Coming yep. up. All right, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.